Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to this week's Telecast. On this week's show, we're celebrating next Monday's International Women's Day with Sarah Gator, Chief Operating Officer at All3 Media, Camilla Lewis, CEO of Curve Media, Laura Marshall, CEO of Icon Films, and Liz Tucker, Chair of Women in Film and TV. To celebrate a year of Telecast, we've teamed up with Workshare Consulting to launch the Telecast Workshare Content Industry Monitor. Taking the pulse of the global business of TV, this exclusive regular survey will analyse your views to find out how the TV business feels about the key issues it faces today. So we're asking all of our listeners from producers to financiers, from distributors to networks and everyone in between to please take a few minutes to fill out our survey. We're asking about how confident you feel about your job or business, how you've been impacted by the lockdown both personally and professionally, how the industry leaders have performed, about virtual markets and events, and the return to a new normal working life and industry recovery. Just go to telecast-podcast.com forward slash survey to complete it. It'll only take 10 minutes and you'll be helping take the temperature of the global TV industry right now. Plus, we'll send you a copy of the full results when we publish in April. Thanks a lot. This week's show is sponsored by Insight TV, who passionately create and share content for the experienced generation. Channel provider, content producer, distributor and format seller, Insight TV delivers real-world stories about the adventures, cultural trends and social causes that resonate with today's millennial and Gen Z audiences. Based upon and inspired by social media trends and influencers, Insight TV operates and distributes a flagship lifestyle channel in vivid 4K UHD HDR quality to 315 million homes in 46 countries via linear cable platforms, digital smart TVs, OTT services, and via watchinsight.tv. It also distributes a mobile-first short-form channel in short, action sports channel in trouble, science and tech channel in wonder, and a nature and wildlife channel in wild, a co-venture with Off The Fence, to fast channels and mobile services around the world. Insight TV partners with global brands and broadcasters, such as Red Bull Media House, G2 Esports, Vice Media and BT Sports to create factual series like Epic Exploring, I Am Invincible and Ultimate Goal. To find out how to do great things together with Insight TV, visit insight.tv or get in touch with the team at marketing at insight.tv. My first guest on this week's show is Sarah Gator, Chief Operating Officer at All3 Media, one of the world's largest TV production and distribution groups. They produce over three and a half thousand hours of content for broadcasters and streamers around the world. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the show. Hi, Justin. Nice to see you. Great to have you on. And how are things at All3 Media? We're, we're starting to emerge gradually from lockdown from a production perspective, but obviously All3 Media has got over 40 production companies in, in your stable. How's it been over the last year? Well, it's been challenging for everybody, um, as it is for everyone in the industry, I think. Obviously, we've got companies in different countries, which adds to the um, overall challenge. Having said that, in New Zealand, they've had very few cases and now soaked down in New Zealand, came back to work very early on in, in, I think, back in last April and has been shooting ever since, which is brilliant. They sort of led the way and gave us lots of information in terms of the fact that they were, even though they had to distance whilst they were shooting, they used things like mannequins to make crowds, scenes and stuff like that. So that was really helpful. We've had, uh, in America, I think, has been particularly badly hit. The production in the States has been extremely challenging. Here in the UK, I think we all uh, did have done a brilliant job, actually, in getting the uh, protocols together. And, of course, I was chairing PACT when we got the um, restart scheme with the government up and running through the BFI. 
Um, and I think that's that's undoubtedly helped. The shows that we're having the most trouble making are the ones where, where, which involve any form of travel. But you know, people have been have been working incredibly hard. Production is is quite a difficult process now, whereas previously I think it was it was obviously much easier. Um, and we're limited as to what you can actually shoot and how you can shoot it. But despite all of that, we've got an amazing amount of production going on. Presumably, the fact that you have both factual and scripted businesses within the the business has has kind of helped you ride this out? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, um, you know, we've had Hollyoaks has been up and running quite a long time now. And I think the team up in Liverpool are working incredibly well and have, have, again, you know, they've all had to be very careful about how they lead their own lives obviously, to reduce the chances of people getting COVID and sets having to stand down. We've done other drama. We've completed drama, which had started shooting prior to the pandemic coming in. But we've managed to finish most of all of those, actually. Um, We've started new ones. And factual, we've been making factual shows as well. So I I think across the board, yes, we are, I think, in a good position. Yeah. And presumably having a strong library has also helped because that's something that I think has been a bit of a trend that we've seen. uh, And certainly the demand for broadcasters has been around recognisable TV brands that, that you can actually acquire you know, hundreds of hours, you know, that are familiar. And that's what people were, were, were looking for, certainly in the first parts of COVID. Yeah, well, I think it was sort of all the way through because I think most of the broadcasters started to run out of new material last June. And I think that in itself has made catalogue sales uh, obviously increase and, and also the amount of time people have had. Of course, when you there's nothing else to do, um, you sit at home and watch an awful lot more uh, TV and I think across the board on every platform that you can watch it on. So I know for a fact that I've watched enormous amounts of television as well as reading vast numbers of books. So, you know, it's a, it's it's been good. And I think our catalogue has definitely uh, sold well. And I think, you know, as you say, iconic shows and, and ones which people can relate to and, and go, oh, I'd really like to see that again, have been doing that. And obviously there's been more bias as well. There's uh, new SVODs coming to the to the market and, and AVODs are, uh, are also uh, very much making themselves known. So this week, we're marking International Women's Day. To my knowledge, you're one of the few female COOs in a major TV industry production business. Could you just very, very briefly sketch out what the difference of a COO is to a CEO? Well, a COO obviously takes a more operational role. A chief executive, actually, I suppose at the end of the day, is the person who runs the business takes ultimately takes all decisions i uh, look at the business from an operational point of view having said that i think it depends who the ceo is that the coo is working with at the end of the day it's how do you what work do you both do um i think the job varies depending on who the ceo is i'm lucky enough to work with jane turton and um, we have a great working relationship which i think means that we pick cover the whole base, I think, in what it takes to run a big business mm. um, and grow that business. And as I say, you're you're one of the few female COOs. Is it just the way that the industry is structured or do you just think that the, the perhaps some barriers to women being able to get to a COO level that are still prevalent in the industry? I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. I think that... Um, I think it depends what route you come up. I mean, you know, my my background is has been production. I'm a lawyer, and I've worked as an accountant in the past. So, across the board, um, I came up through the production route. I mean, I know of a couple of other. I mean, Lucinda Hicks was obviously the COO at, at uh, Endemol Shine. She's now become the CEO in the UK, I think. Um, and I'm sure there's some others. But I don't know why there aren't more. It's, an, it's a really interesting question, actually. Speaking personally, have you experienced or do you still experience any barriers in the industry as a woman? And if you don't, do you see 
those barriers for others? I think it comes down to the kind of personality you have as well, actually, at the end of the day, and how confident you are in 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 approaching issues. Um, I think one of the things you have to be is to be confident standing up and speaking. I've always, I think, been able to do that. Um, I think the biggest barrier for women is the one where I often think women don't think they're good enough. Mm. Um, they don't think they've got enough experience. Uh, whereas, you know, I think men have this, or some men have this idea that they can do anything regardless. Uh, it's quite an interesting um, issue, I think. And I think sometimes women, you know, I stand there and I go, look, just do it. Just stand up and just say, yes, you're going to do it and go and do it and see what happens. Because what's the worst that can happen to you? You just have to go back to where you were previously or learn a bit more. Yeah. And this is something known as imposter syndrome, isn't it? Yeah. I'm sure many men experience this as well. But do you think it's more prevalent? Do you think women experience this imposter syndrome more than men? I don't know. I I think women have... I mean, obviously, there are a lot less women in more senior roles than there are men. So there must be a reason for that. I suspect there are there are many. I think one of them is that they don't feel confident enough. I think another one is to do with how people network. And I think that often, you know, I, I think it's opening up a bit now, the diversity and inclusion um, issues, the Me Too movement, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, all of those have really helped to open up the industry. Um, and I think that will help people pre- who haven't previously been in a position to get senior roles to now be considered for them. Um, I think everybody wants to have get a senior role based on their ability as opposed to being, you know, because they're a woman or because they're black. So, um, but at the same time, I think it's around opportunity. And I think, It's really important that people who are in those roles, um, CEO, COO roles, actually do ensure that the opportunity is there now for for a lot of people to, or women of all abilities and all ages, to actually have an opportunity to rise up through the ranks. It's about getting that level playing field for for everyone in the industry when it comes to diversity. And, And perhaps that's one of the you know, the beneficial outcomes of this dreadful COVID crisis that we've had, that everybody's perhaps looked at the issues and, and maybe will come out of it in a, in a more equitable way. I think people have had an opportunity to speak, you know, to, to, to communicate and to connect with people that maybe they couldn't connect with before because people have had more time or it feels like they've had more time. You know, we're trying to open all jobs up. We're trying to ensure that where we advertise for jobs that they are uh, we we have a much wider um cohort of people who are able to apply for those jobs and i think that's really important and i think that's i think it's important for not just for women but it's um because within women you've obviously got socioeconomic groups that maybe need more help in accessing um, our industry you've you've got um, women of color who need more help um, accessing the industry and all of that and I think it just needs to open up more really um, and and it's it, it's up to those of us that have got those jobs to try and enable that to happen do you think the TV industry should be investing a little more in training in terms of you know coming back to this the point we talked about earlier this imposter syndrome you know, we've all had to be paying the apprenticeship levy for a start. And it's how do we use the apprenticeship levy to actually get apprentices into our industry? Mm. Um, and I think that's an important um, element because previously we haven't actually been able to use that money to bring those apprentices into the industry. So we're looking at that. I think we, we're we constantly looking at courses. I mean, you know, there's skill set and um, there's the, there are various courses around this National Film School um, and lots of others, which I think now are, are looking at, at how they recruit for those courses and who they're recruiting on those courses, which is really important. I mean, all three, we um, 
we sponsor um, one of the a couple of the writing courses at the National Film School for the AME students to access. And I think that's working quite well. Um, but it's still only a small number. So I think we all need to do something and ensure that we do it properly. There's still areas of the industry where women are still relatively underrepresented. And, you know, a few of those are, for example, indie leadership. We're not talking super indies. We're talking about regular indies, directors, post-production. And I'm sure there's a few other areas as well. How do we overcome that? Training, as you've said or already said, uh, Justin, is an important aspect of that. Um, I think it is about opportunity. We need to give people a chance. You know, we need to take risk. We need to, we need to say, okay, we are going to give you the chance to direct something, or we're going to give you the chance to shoot something, or you know, and actually push the boat out a bit. Coming back to your career, Sarah, you've had a very successful career. You obviously hold one of the most senior roles in the UK production industry. Do you think your career would have been any different if you were a man when it comes to opportunities that you might have seen along the way that might have not have been open to you? Or do you think there would have been any difference at all there? I have had a great career, um, but I've also been... Um, I've stood up and said what I think, and sometimes I'm not sure always on a popular basis, but I've still done it and gone home and thought, oh my God, should I have done that? You know, kind of thing. Um, would I have, uh, I actually wouldn't want to be doing anything different. I think I'm very lucky in the sense of what I am doing and what I've achieved. A lot of it's to do with the people I've worked with. You know, I've worked with some really impressive people. I've worked with with people who've given me a chance along the way and who have backed me. And um, I've learned a lot from that. And I think I've hopefully been doing the same with people I know. And I hope I've been supportive um, to people in enabling them to achieve what they want to achieve in their careers as well, where I've been able to influence that. And if you were to look back at the 20-year-old you now, and if you were starting out in the industry now, what sort of advice would you give yourself? I probably would have been a bit bolder earlier on. I think I would have said, go on, have a go. I mean, there were some jobs which I probably would like to have applied for along the way, which I didn't because I thought I wasn't good enough or didn't know enough. And I think, you know, it's one of those advantages of age, isn't it? You suddenly think, oh, God, what a, I should have done that. I always spend quite a lot of time saying, to, or I suppose to say to people, you know, and they go, well, I don't know if I can do that. And I go, what is the worst thing that's going to happen to you? Because I think if you, can, if you can overcome the worst thing that's likely to happen to you. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day, actually, a producer who was having a problem with something. And I said to her, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? So she well, Sanso says that they're going to walk off or they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And I said, okay, if they do walk off, what are you going to do? And I think if you can work that one through, then actually, you know, you sort of face your own fears and go for it. Um, what's the worst thing that can happen to you if you apply for a job is you get turned down. And then I think you just have to stand up and go, well, okay, that one maybe didn't work. And you ask for feedback as well. I think that's the other thing is asking for feedback when things don't go the way maybe you would like them to and find out why they didn't work or what what it was that that person did, why they didn't employ you, why did they employ someone else, and hope that you get some honest feedback. It's embracing failure, isn't it? It's not being afraid to, because, I mean, we, we hear this from leaders right across many industries, is that, you know, don't be afraid to fail. And that's where that's actually where you learn. The most is, you know, you fall flat on your face, pick yourself up and go, ah, I won't do that again. But, you know, that's it's a great piece of knowledge you've got to take forward and in terms of how you, you know, you do things differently in the future. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like standing up and speaking in public, isn't it? Which is that, you know, the more you do it, the better you get. Uh, somebody said to me once, you know, I said, oh, my God, I've got to go and do this talk. And they said, yes, but the people are there because they want to hear what you've got to say. 
and you think, oh, actually, yeah, they're not there under duress. You know, they don't actually have to sit in the room. And I think that makes a big difference when you sort of switch it around and go, okay. So I think it's about trying things. You're right. It's about trying things, being a bit brave and holding your breath and off you go. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us this week. It's been fascinating to to speak to you. You know, wish you all the very best throughout this year. Thank you. You know, let's keep our fingers crossed that uh, we're on top of the pandemic and and we can all see each other in in Cannes or other industry events. Imagine those. Imagine an industry event. Yay. I <laughs> know. Oh, Wouldn't that be great? God, <laughs> going outside and drinking and meeting people. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. All the best. So my next guests this week are leading UK indie bosses, Camilla Lewis of Curve Media, Laura Marshall from Icon Films, and Women in Film and TV Chair, Liz Tucker. Welcome to the show, guys. Hello. Hello. Great to have you with us in this special International Women's Day episode. Um, Camilla, let's start with you. Um, Looking at some of your recent announcements, it looks like lockdown hasn't slowed up production too much at Curve. Well, I think everyone's production has been slowed down. And I'd be lying to say that we haven't been impacted by lockdown. We all have been. We've been, you know, pretty lucky. A lot of the broadcasters came to us, mostly the BBC, Channel 4, Channel 5 um, and, and Discovery and sort of asked us what we could do to kind of help them in the very difficult early stages. And, and it changed. I'm sure everyone feels this, that the relationship between producer and broadcaster really changed very quickly um, from being a kind of like a, you know, always feeling a bit like we were at war with them, to be honest, to being much more of a collaborative and, and, and brilliantly balanced process. And, and some of that has sustained. So without being too Pollyanna, there's been a really lovely shift in how we approach and how they approach us, whereby they kind of knew we would, could deliver programmes. And we filmed, we're very lucky, we filmed the whole way through. Uh, there's not been a day we haven't had our cameras on on, a, on at least a few productions. Um, and now we've got, I think, 16 shows in production right now um, across uh, Terrestrial and a couple of SVODs um, and some um, sort of like what were previously cable channels um, are now are all sort of becoming an SVOD somewhere along the line. Um, so it, it has, of course, it's impacted on us. It's been a bloody nightmare. I mean, who hasn't it been a nightmare for? Um, and an incredibly anxious period of time. But um, but in terms of like, I mean, we've lost money. Everyone's lost money. But we haven't lost as much money as perhaps we could have done. And I think that's partly down to the fact, I, I'm, and I'm sure this is the case with, with the other producers on the call, that it's, you know, we've got a good reputation for delivery. So we we don't, we, we have had very good relationships with the broadcasters. They've been great, actually, almost across the board. I say almost. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Well, uh, that's interesting to hear that, that, you know, that relationship has changed slightly. I mean, obviously in the UK, it's slightly different to it is in America when it's worth a higher and, and, uh, and I guess that changes the relationship again. But it's interesting that uh, perhaps production businesses are perhaps seen in a more powerful role, do you think, overall? Has the, has the balance of power shifted? That's a really good question. And I think I'd like to say yes, but I don't think, I don't, for me, the power has always been with the producer. I mean, obviously in my, you know, deluded mind, I always think that I'm all powerful and some sort of godlike figure. No, but I think ultimately what's shifted is that they couldn't, companies that deliver like Icon, like Curve, who are well known for delivery, they could rely on. And in a time when everything felt very frightening and things weren't very reliable and we didn't know where we stood and, you know, what did health and safety mean in a time when actually health and safety really counted and suddenly meant the world? I think the broadcasters have fallen back. I wonder how it's impacted. I'm sure this is not a universal story. I think some small indies might have suffered quite a lot. Some startups who haven't got a huge reputation might have had a very difficult time. I don't think it's been a party for anybody and it's certainly not been a party for us it's just that that relationship and that collaboration has had to grow because we've had to learn together how we make programs in a really complex time yeah perhaps the only beneficiaries and we've we've uh, touched on this a few times on telecaster are the svods and the avods they've been huge beneficiaries but maybe we'll come on and, and touch on that a little bit later on you're an established production business camilla Presumably, library content has played a big role as well in weathering the storm. Like like many established UK indies, it must have been key to have that library. I think, yes, some things were like, let's reversion quickly. How many more episodes of this can we get? Can we recut this that way? That did happen. 
And actually, I think at first, and I'm sure this is true across the industry, we all thought, oh, my God, it's all going to be about archive. What can we find? What can we do? What can we buy? What can we get in? How can we make things work? And, and, and only one show of ours, actually a, a Channel 5 show, which hasn't been announced, I can't, can't mention it, but was Commission, which was pretty much purely archive. That show was the only one in the end. Ironically, we found we could shoot. So I think one of the great things about being a factual indie as opposed to, say, a drama indie who were faced with huge problems right up front was that we could go out on the road with a very small cruise, much more controllable in terms of health and safety. We could be outside. We could keep social distancing. And we filmed with the BBC and Channel 4 immediately. So honestly, the day the day of announcements of lockdown, we were, we were very lucky to be given commissions by them to make shows at that time about reflecting that time. So I think that made us and forced us into a position of being able to cope with filming under COVID. And, and those regulations and those rules, which are amazing production management team run by Paul Day, have really meant that we've got to the point where we know what we're doing and we've got really strong protocols in place, as I think most people have now. Yeah. Laura, coming to you. First of all, full disclosure, I represent Icon Films for PR. I'm very well you do that too, Justin. Thank you very much. 50% of next month's fees. Thank you. But I, I know you've been busy with some really ambitious productions in far-flung places over the last year. But um, could you share some of Icon's recent and current productions and what you've been up to over the last few months? You know, this time last year, we had crews in Brazil, we had crews in Paraguay, we had crews in a lot of places where we needed to get them back very quickly from. And, you know, our production management teams are, as Camilla has said, totally brilliant. That's why they, you know, the UK is completely world class in factual production as well as drama production. And they got them back safe and sound. But I think for us, then there was this moment where... So much of what we do, probably 90% of what we do is shot overseas that we had to really sit back and work out what we could do safely. And again, you know, echoing Camilla, I think our commissioners really knew that they could trust in us. So we were always part of the conversation, which is how do we get you back in the field? How can you tell us how we're going to get back in the field? And there was this exchange of information that went between production companies, commissioners and other production companies. How are you doing this? What are you prepared to do? What are the risks you think we should take? What are we not prepared to take? And there was a huge amount of thinking that went on. And and I used um, I use the word pause a lot because I think sometimes we... You know, it takes so long to sell a programme and then the commissioners want it so quickly that sometimes you don't have that moment of pause. Well, as we all know, we had a moment of pause and we thought a lot about how we were going to get back into the field. And then we started building on the extreme health and safety that we've always done, hostile environments. It was just a slightly different hostile environment. So... Um, having paused, thought about it, and gone into deep conversations with our broadcasters, which, you know, National Geographic, with Vice, with Blue Ant, with Discovery, we worked about what we felt was our own health and safety protocols. Because I think, like a lot of production companies, we use the broadcasters' health and safety protocols as a starting point, but we need to have our own. We have to believe in our own risk assessments we have to believe in we have to accept our own risks and it can never be less than that which is imposed upon us and it's we're probably even more stringent because you know I'm sending those crews out and I want to count them all out and I want to count them all back again so there was a lot of health and safety and then a lot of identification of countries where we could travel to so we got to Iceland very, very on. We got to Kenya. Um, and now we've got crews in Malawi. We've got crews in South America. We've got crews in the South Pacific, all working under extreme, very diligent health and safety, looking after them and looking after the people that we come into contact with. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. And and you also mentioned some relatively new broadcasters to Icon, Vice and Blue Ant as well. Do you think that's essentially just a general increase in demand for natural history content? Because obviously we're seeing lots of new players coming to the to the market, new streamers, etc. Also different broadcasters as well. Is that is that a general 
increasing demand across the board for for the type of content that Icon produces? Well, interestingly, you'd think that um, in in, in lockdown and a pandemic, people might want to play safe. But actually, I think what the, the metrics have shown us that in a time when we're all shut in rooms, people want to see the great world outside. And because Icon had been doing it a very long time and were very trusted, some new customers came to us and said, can you take us to places our viewers want to go to? And we knew that we could. And so it was fantastic to pick up some, you know, about 18 hours of new commissions in lockdown to go to far flung faces and do what we do best. So I think there is, you know, that there's a lot of conversation about a natural history boom and, you know, is it going to bust? But the thing about natural history is the natural world has always been with us. People always have wanted to understand the world in which they live better than they do. And now is this extraordinary moment where the technology is at a point where we can we can actually deliver on the promises that we have been making for a very long time. There isn't a day that you don't open your web page and see some extraordinary, wonderful natural history or uh, conservationist or eco or even some natural world program telling you that they're going to show you something. And this time in high definition, UHD, in super technicolor and binaural sound under a microscope, it is very, very exciting. And I think the viewers want that. Commissioners are, are looking around for it. Going back to what you were saying about production in the field, and this is also a question for Camilla, lots of new protocols that everyone's had to bring in. Clearly, that comes with a cost, an added cost, and we've heard you know figures up to 20% are on top of regular production budgets. Have broadcasters generally accepted that without much, much argument? Camilla, coming to you first. I think there's a really mixed field out there. Um, I, don't, I think some broadcasters, and namely public service ones, to be honest, have been really great and really open to an, a dialogue about it. I think it's harder in the commercial world. I think that there's been whole issues about insurance. I think what Laura said correctly about um, the community of the production, um, I mean, there's been amazing kind of Facebook groups and people coming together who are talking and sharing information, uh, certainly early, early on and still, still now, um, both formally and informally. And, and I think that, that has meant that we've, we've all kind of had a very joined up and packed have been fantastic, uh, a joined up approach to how we deal with um, the broadcasters and, and what we say about this. I mean, to be honest, it's an ongoing issue because COVID costs are now sort of like, it's not disappearing out of the budget, but they're sort of being either subsumed or seen slightly separately. I think it's a real problem, which 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 won't go away, but actually equally it is diminished because we know what the risks are and we know how to sort of like mostly to, to balance against them. Uh, can I just go back to one at one point, which I'm sure Laura would agree, one of the great things about the last year is that it's been a great equaliser for people. So uh, business for us in America, we've been, you know, long wanting to be like, conquer America. And it's this year that we've got a big series away that we've been making in America. Uh, and that's happened because we can be on Zoom at any time of day. And, and actually, that would never have happened so easily. It was much more complicated to, to coordinate and no one else was doing it. So, so now, and I think this is true of some small indies too, who I've spoken to, they feel that they've got more FaceTime with, say, Channel 4 or whoever, because the commissioners are, it's just easier to meet them. And, and, and it's become much more uh, of an equal playing field in that way. And I think that's, that's been a great thing. Yeah, hopefully that's something that's going to continue. Laura, have you found broadcasters have accepted increase costs due to new protocols have they they generally been pretty understanding in your experience i think the phrase that we're all using at the moment it's a conversation there is absolutely an acceptance that the costs that you might have envisaged going up front particularly if you were commissioned before covid you know are going to change and that's either because there's been a hiatus or increased covid security quarantining whatever cost there is and i think that there is an expectation both that producers will step up as will commissioners and i think that if you approach the conversations like that and you go into those conversations with commissioners saying you know it's not the same cost. I know it's not the same cost. We know there are some savings that we might be able to make, but there are some that we simply, you know, there is a net increase. How are we going to deal with this? And particularly in the world of the SVOD, where it's sort of commissioner takes all, there are no 
back end deals where you can mop up your losses, that conversation is actually happening at the moment. And, you know, it, it's really good. And it means that, as Camilla said earlier, there is a that there is more conversation between commissioners and producers at the moment. And I think because they are working with trusted producers, commissioners feel that they can really open up and share their own issues. Because, of course, you know, the channels, the Uslubs, they they've had their uh, cash issues as well. So I think we are working together. I'm not saying it's entirely satisfactory, but we haven't got to the end yet. So we're all working very hard and mindful of doing the best thing that we can with the money available, but not cutting any safety corners because, you know, you, you can't do that. It's too dangerous. It's far too dangerous for us and for the people that we meet with, particularly when we're going far from places. We want to make sure that you know, we're not taking anything nasty with us. This remote working has allowed us to work with different people, people we might not have worked with before. You know, I'm a Bristol production company. We've got a lot of team working remotely in London. I've always hired Bristol folk because we're a Bristol company, but it, it, it's, a, it's a different world that we're working. We also hiring a lot of crew in country at the moment, whether they're producers, camera, PCs, PMs. That's been really exciting, managing to expand our workforce globally to make sure that we're keeping on delivering. And that's a sort of a bit of a quality too, because there are a lot of people wanting to break into the UK market and the US market. And going through UK production company is allowing them to do that and get those stuff on their CV. So there's, there's some interesting things happening at the moment. Interesting. Liz, welcome to the show. International Women's Day is presumably a big date in your calendar. What has women in film and TV got planned for this year? Absolutely, kind of a huge day, I hope, in all our calendars, uh, Justin. Yeah, we've got a, a major event called The House, where we're bringing a wide range of experts, whether they be commissioners, actors, writers, activists. And we try to create, I suppose, if you like, a sort of virtual coffee house so our members can come along and join in for a chat chat to a commissioner perhaps in the way you might do if you were at a festival or in a bar talk to other writers so we've got a huge range of people we've got Mira Seal who's going to introduce it Leslie Sharp who's going to close proceedings for us Uh, because I think what I'm very conscious of this Women's Day more than any really is that you know what Camilla and Laura have had to say is terrific and has largely been very positive you know without being too much of a downer obviously as an organisation that supports women we've also had a lot of our members who've lost an awful lot of work. Um, And so I think that sense of sort of virtual community has been more important than it's ever been before. And I think it it particularly depends, you know, as as I think both of them also touched on, the types of programmes that get made in terms of how affected people are. And that, you know, so some documentary programmes, for example, are much easier to make in a kind of COVID secure way that, than others. People who are working in large OBs and things, for example, have largely gone. So we are also, you know, dealing with trying to keep everybody on board and positive, but also recognising that, you know, a very large proportion of people working in this industry have not had any income for months and months. Yeah, absolutely. And presumably freelancers has been the sector that's been the most critically hit. Well, I think, you know, our industry is so based on freelance, self-employed workers. I think even where we have got commissions, the other half of the debate about budgets and how people manage that is in a number of cases, broadcasters have cut their budgets, which means people are also coping not only with additional COVID costs, but also with reduced budgets. The concern, obviously, is with the budget coming up on the third, that there's some talk that there will be an increase in tax rates for freelancers, which if people already have not earned any money this year will be somewhat of a double whammy. Yeah. One of women in film and TV's main missions is to achieve parity in the TV and film industry when it comes to representation right across the industry. Whilst we do have many women in leadership roles in in the TV business in particular, I gather there's still quite a lot of work to do in other areas in the industry. Yeah, huge. I mean, it's interesting actually having having Laura and Camilla on today, because I I would say if you look across broadcasters, you often find a greater level of women than you do in the indie sector. When you look at the number of women running indies, it's still relatively kind of small. Um, And so I 
I, I don't know, Laura and Camilla may have a, have a view on why that is. Um, so I think that's part of an issue. But I think for WFTV, it's not about sort of moaning. It's about trying to get things changed, really. So there's some things which are, I think are obvious, like the lack of female directors. And I think that needs broadcasters to be aware of it and to be kind of working towards a more equitable playing field. And that means, I think, being more open to new ideas, because I'm, I know a lot of indies will say that when they go in to talk to broadcasters, broadcasters often, for example, have a very clear idea about names that they'd like to direct a particular show, which, again, doesn't necessarily help drive diversity. And then on the sort of post-production side, where it's still largely very male, I think one of the things that's interesting is when you see product, post-production houses such as Envy and The Farm, which have traditionally had strong female leadership, you see far more women in those companies. So I think it's a mixture of a mixture of approaches, really, that we need to look at. So how can the industry change then to become more representative of women in, for example, post-production? Well, it's interesting, actually. I think having more women in leadership roles in post-production really helps drive that. But I think it's also about educating young women, because I think if you went into a, into a classroom, people might have an idea about being a producer or director, but I think they would have no idea about working in a post house and they might ex imagine you've got to have a kind of really kind of technical background well you don't those are all kind of heavily creative roles and one of the post houses was complaining to me you know when they're looking for 18 year old trainees they just don't get the women even applying so i think that's something that we're looking at the moment whether we can develop some sort of form of scheme that can not only help a number of women get their first job in post-production houses but also alert other women to actually that this is a career that's worth worth considering because I think it's something that a lot of women don't even think about. Uh, it's a question for Laura and Camilla coming to you Camilla first of all have you found any barriers to success in in your career? Well I mean obviously yes I mean it, 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 not when you say barriers to success that's not how I'd frame it I think dealing with sexism, everyday sexism, dealing with one's own internalized sexism, <laughs> dealing with dealing with with how to cope with. I mean, there's not a day that passes when I don't face either external or internal issues with being a woman in the industry. I, and I think that it's really interesting to hear what you were saying, Liz, about about why women are drawn to certain bits of the industry. It's very precarious running a production company, and I'm sure Laura would agree. It's scary, and, and, it, and, and, and it, it is a really tough thing. And traditionally, men have been cast in that role by women too and by men. And, and I, think, I think it's been very hard to prove yourself in that world without being seen as, I mean, you know more than I do. I'm obsessed about the way women are perceived in the industry. And, 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 and you know, I don't want to be anti-men, and I'm certainly not. Um, but I am very, very pro-women um, in the way I'm trying to hold on to those female directors who fall off the you know they disappear in their 30s and onwards and it's very hard to keep women and retain great talent uh, with, with women as they get older because often it's just an industry that doesn't appeal for lots of reasons because it's set up in such a patriarchal way but but kind of like that everyday thing and having to deal with it is 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 i mean it's just ongoing but I, you don't want it to be bitter and twisted it's not about whinging as you rightly said liz or, or however you put it it's about kind of like dealing with the, and then trying to make transparent some of those things and, and recognising that there are women who you can, you, you should be supporting each other and bringing each other on. Uh, you, we need women in more roles and we need more women running in this. And, and I hope that by seeing people like me and Laura, more women will feel that they are capable of doing that as well as potentially having families and successful lives outside of the industry. Yeah, I was talking to a Channel 4 commissioner, actually, and she was saying that she'd, been work, she'd worked at the BBC and she was really shocked when she became a commissioner at Channel 4 that she just had endless meetings with men coming in to pitch things to her. You know, it was the first time that she really realised how dependent the indie sector is on companies which are led by men. Yeah, absolutely. It is. The whole structure is set up like quite a male oriented structure. It's about winning and fighting and com competitive. And by, by no means am I not saying that women can't own those attributes and or work with those attributes. But it is it's fundamentally women. As I go back to that internalised thing. I think it's very hard when there's a whole language that's attributed to powerful women like myself, where I've been deemed to be mad and kind of like a ambitious rather than kind of like driven and maverick. And, and I think that, that we need to think really carefully about how we ourselves frame women and women are perceived within the industry that, you know, I, I get it, as I said, daily. <laughs> there's not a day that passes when I don't, I don't get irritated by it. But I think managing it is, is, is a whole other thing. It's because we're very British and it's quite difficult to kind of say, you know what, I think that's really outrageous and sexist. Or, or maybe we should say it more often. Um, 
but it's it's a kind of long long slow battle as well as an acute battle. And what I think with female directors is a slightly different issue that I, I've seen again and again that you have the you have the kind of the classic pattern the the female producer who will be the safe pair of hands will do all the logistics an awful lot of the legwork and then you'll get in the male director who will be perceived as sort of you know sort of sprinkling the, the the kind of stardust. Um, and I've just seen that pattern over and over again. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And that's absolutely dreadful. And that is really, really repeated. Uh, and that is, you know, one of the major kind of um, issues in the industry, which is that the man's allowed to be, you know. And in fact, really recently, I'm doing a feature doc at the moment. I can't discuss which broadcaster, a very big feature doc with very big name talent um, executing it. Um, and, and, and actually, we've wanted to use a female director. But I, it's very hard to kind of persuade people that the woman is as good as the man because her manner in coming across is quite female, which is a good thing, obviously. But it's different from how men come across. And traditionally, we're all internalised into thinking that's the way you need to be forthright to the point, you know, maybe more dogmatic. <laughs> Laura, have you found any challenges in your career in terms of barriers to success or uh, examples of areas that being a woman has perhaps impeded you you being able to be successful even on a particular project it, it's such a difficult question to to answer truthfully that because Camilla referred to you know the internal dialogue is are you good enough are you getting it right can you do this the imposter syndrome that I think that so many women suffer from that is probably the biggest barrier to success that I face myself and it's the one that I'm most conscious about when I'm working with women particularly younger women in my company is saying you know you are good you know you are great you know you can do this and when I was appointing runners, when I used to do all the runner recruitment, I would be looking for young women and indeed men who could grow through the company and replace me when the time came. I think that it's really important that when you're working with women is that you you absolutely support their self-confidence and their ability that they can go all the way right from the start. You want to fast track everybody to success and particularly young women. I've had three daughters, so I'm particularly aware of that. You know, the unconfident woman or young woman is a very fragile creature and they need all the support they can get. And I'm not saying that young men don't need support as well. I was very lucky. I, I worked with Harry, my husband, and he's been incredibly supportive. But it's interesting, isn't it, that the senior management team at Icon Films, Harry's the chair, I'm the chief executive, we are women-led. It's it's a very strong female-led production company with a female head of development. And, you know, with a female commercial director and with a female director of production. So I do recognise the barriers to success, but I also can see that if you put strong role models, you will. We, and we've got a brilliant post-production team, we do a lot of production in-house, of young women coming up through the finishing role, through the editing role, through the you know, production technical coordinator role. I do see equality growing and growing, but I do think it needs nurturing. You know, with the apprenticeships and with the Kickstarter tree, we have to start at the beginning of their career. We have to start at the beginning that they can go all the way. And I think it's not just also the beginning, Laura. I think also there's quite often, as Camilla touched on, sort of drop off from sort of early 30s onwards when women quite often are juggling other things, whether that be family, whether that be caring responsibilities. I mean, interesting, one of the things that WFTV does is we actually have a mid-career mentoring scheme because actually that felt like a real gap. Um, and actually just, just in time for International Women's Day, in fact, on, on on this Friday, we're launching two new schemes and two schemes that we ran last year. We used to have one scheme just for England, but now we will have four schemes, which is Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland and England. And that is all aimed at mid-career women who often for various reasons get stuck so having a you know, high level mentor who can support them, who's out of their immediate work environment and so can talk to them very openly. I think you can you can really see when you go sort of two years on how those women's careers have developed from our previous mentees. COVID has given us an opportunity to pause and we have an opportunity to reflect about how we manage our companies and our industry. And you're right, mid-career development is absolutely essential to pushing people through. But how women who have children 
are managing that and managing their careers through juggling everything. And you, they, are, they are indeed gods and goddesses, the men and women juggling homeschooling and running their careers during this period have done phenomenally. But it's an opportunity for us to, to, to rethink how we run our offices, how we run our companies, what it looks like. But it's also allowed women who want to maybe work from home and work different hours to work different hours if they can manage their time. And I think you're right, as companies, we need to make sure we're at the forefront of being as, as flexible as is production sensible and, and financially sensible to be so. But but I also think it's interesting because in the year that Black Lives Matter has brought brilliantly to our attention, more, more so than ever before, the issues of diversity and getting more BAME representation off camera, you know, I think that goes hand in hand. I mean, the two things, it, it, it we have a, to have a very, holistic and very intersectional approach as to how we approach the whole issue of women it's not it's women and it's, it's making sure that BAME women as well because they have different and unique and, 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 and similar um, issues to all women you know obviously but I think we there, there are issues that are unique in class terms as well all of this has to be considered and so in looking at women it's looking at everything and having an approach that allows you to think about you know, why we're at a point in the industry and we still are at a point where there is endless representation from white middle-aged men um, and, and actually they are still the predominant force. Shockingly so, they still are. Even though I started my career and they were all white middle-aged men, they still are a lot of white middle-aged men. And I think women are much more affected by ageism in the industry. That was the other thing I was going to say about mid-career women. Um, you know, some very well-known men in the industry have, you know, objected to employing high-level women because they were of a certain age. And I think, you know, given that we all live, live longer, given that people have portfolio careers and perhaps may come to television perhaps as a second or even third career, we've got to be far more open to that. And there's definitely a feeling that post-35, oh, do we really want to employ that, employ that director? There's terrible ageism against women in the, in the industry. I mean, I've watched some brilliant. I mean, I was, you know, the, my great mentors, Glenn Benson, Lorraine Hegarty, Jana Bennett. I mean, they're no longer in the industry for one reason or another. But 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 every woman I've admired who is older than me seems to have gone. Bar you know you know your Jane Root and yourself, uh, slightly older than me, mildly Laura. Um, but you know, it, there, there, there's. I think it's really terrifying because I think that that sexism and the idea of being an old woman you know within society we've got to be really transparent about what that means to us and what it means to men and what the how the industry reacts when 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 you know young thrusting man comes in compared to older women as opposed to we want to start inheriting and owning culturally all those kind of tags and tropes of being wise old women because that's a brilliant thing because you get better at your job not worse of course of course much better i'm much better now than i was 20 i'm much cleverer <laughs> I'm just I am I'm much, much better. I'm good now, I can say it. <laughs> you know, I am actually delighted on International Women's Day I will be sixty and I'm absolutely thrilled to be sixty. Congratulations. Congratulations. And but yeah, I'm also, you know, putting up for a, a new role at Icon Films and it's one it's an EDI talent manager. And um, equality, diversity and inclusion. I think in 2021, people are going to understand what that means in a way they didn't in 2020. And in 2020, if somebody said, what do you mean a talent manager, EDI? I don't get it. I would have said, yeah, not sure myself. In 2021, I really get it. And I'm going to make sure that we all get it because that is how we are going to change the look of our industry and the success of our industry. And, you know, I want to be an old lady working this industry and I want to be working with young women. And, you know, I, I, want, I want to be part of the change. I'm going to be the change. I want to be part of it. Laura, it, it was very interesting what you said before about having three daughters. Because I've got two daughters and two sons. And that sense of entitlement that comes with having men as opposed to women as children, you know, it is quite shocking, the difference. And even though they've been brought up in a very right on environment, I think that that, that is what is a, we, we've got to be aware. And I think what you're saying about how, this year is a year going forward where we have to be open to diversity and aware of all the issues and bringing people in for the sake of our industry. It's essential. And now it's transparent. Let's keep it transparent. Let's not forget. It's not. It's Black Lives Matter. It's BAME. It's, it's about class. It's about women. We've got to really keep our eyes open to staying relevant. Yeah. And, and let's use what the government is going to be giving us in terms of the Kickstarter and the apprentices scheme to make sure that happens. We all need a helping hand. You know, and, and bring more people into our industry who are going to make it more interesting. God, you know, can't keep making the same programmes forever.
you know, clearly all forms of diversity are incredibly important, including disability, which we haven't we haven't yet yes, yes, talked yes. about. But what I've seen in some quarters is there's almost a feeling, oh, the box is ticked for women. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree. So I'm mean, having conversations with the broadcasters about this because clearly stuff like Black Lives Matter is incredibly important. But, you know, you know, I pointed out it's, it wasn't just, you know, black led Indies that were kind of, you know, in a tiny, tiny group. That also applied to female led Indies. It applied to small Indies. And there's a, I think we need to shout loudly so that we don't forget forgotten. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Liz. And I think it's I think it's it is about, as I said, it's keeping it we're really lucky. We've all been forced to face a look at ourselves inside. We haven't been able to go outside. So most people have spent the year in one way or another, and often it's led them to being have major mental health issues. But going inside and thinking, what is going on in my head? Where am I at? What am I thinking? I think as an industry, we've done the same thing. We've gone interior. And because of that interior thought process and, uh, and thinking through what actually matters and how we want to be as an industry, I completely agree with you. We must not lose sight of the the battles that have gone before and the battles to go forward. And unfortunately, they are battles. I'd love to say it's not. But I think there are battles to make sure that diversity is not seen as a tip box exercise, but actually, as Laura brilliantly and rightly said, if we're going to be relevant and we're going to be watched, and that's all we all want, let's be honest, then, then ultimately we need to be reflective. So now it's time in the show where my guests get to choose the TV industry story of the week over the past seven days. Camilla, what's your story of the week? Just more SVODs, more SVODs, more SVODs, more SVODs. I mean, it feels like almost every week another one's launched and or, or at least um, stating its claim. And I think the story that interests me the most is Paramount Plus saying that it aims for, is it 75 million more subscriptions or some, or some such thing. Um, and, and, and obviously it's really exciting and great being a producer in a market where there's an ever-expanding international potential market um, to play in. Uh, in some places we're already playing. But I can't help but think as a consumer, as a viewer, um, at the moment, I subscribe um, to Netflix and Amazon Prime and Sky. And, and Sky is slightly different, of course, because it allows you to bro- – it, it is also broadcast stuff too. It's very cleverly kind of like it has a, a huge range of output that you can watch through it. But but I, I just don't know where I'm going because I want to sign up now because of personal reasons and of professional reasons to star – and, and therefore Disney Plus. But then I think, God, how many of these things am I going to do? And I'm obviously quite well, you know, I'm a good earner compared to most people uh, potentially listening to this, or maybe not. I, I can't afford to carry on having subscription after subscription. When's consolidation going to happen? And what's it going to look like for the future? And I suspect what really interests me is the rise of the AVOD, because I think American cable, if we look at what happened with America and how that moved into being, you know, the cable being the kind of the long tail of broadcasting, I just wonder if the same thing will happen in an international global sense, where by SVODs, you know, how many bigger, bolder, better stuff can we have? How many talent-led programs? Will they just end up having a few key things? And then will there be more AVODs for us to consume? I'm really intrigued as to what the future holds. We had uh, Ollie Davis from Samsung on last week, and he was telling us about Samsung TV Plus. And that's basically an AVOD system that is baked into the hardware. And if you've got 120 hours of catalog for you can actually have your own channel brand like it so there's you know there's midsummer murders channel there's you know lots of different channels that if you've got that much content for your back catalog you can get that content to work for you i mean what's what's not to like of, of, on that when you just sat back and earning money presumably Rather like Camilla said i think you know there is a plethora of choices and then we have are are we just going to go back where we're always going to have to lean forward and make a choice about whether we're going to do on demand or we're ever going to watch scheduled television ever again? Of course we are, because we all love that being led by the nose to something exciting, whether it's Jed Mercurio or the BBC News. But I think what it tells me is it has never been a better time to be a producer because there is all this choice and there are so many places that you can go with your stories if you're a good confident producer or if you're starting out and you've got a great idea there are people who are willing to listen because I think some of the SVODs are much more open to a gamble because of course every creative choice is a gamble and I think that it is a really brilliant time if you are a producer to go out there and create ideas and then pitch them to the person that you want to create them. I'm going to make sure that the brilliant creative people in our company are able to say, I want to go and pitch to these people. It's exciting. I mean, it's so exciting. And it's a great time to be a factual producer in particular because everybody's 
still being able to work over the last few months? Clearly, there's a huge range of stuff, and it's it's revolutionised how I watch TV. I hardly ever watch scheduled TV now. So even if I'm watching Terrestrial, I've just got so used to recording everything that I watch. But I would say, actually, on the specialist factual side, if you, in terms of serious science and things, I think there's less of that now. It's, the BBC is not doing it, who would traditionally have done it. Channel 4 Science Output is not as it once was. And I don't see that content being delivered by Netflix, Sky. So I think there are certain gaps. There are certain areas which which we are, if anything, oversupplied with, but other parts of the market where I think we're not so well supplied. Laura, what's your story of the week? Well, my story of the week is really about, it's about apprenticeships. And I think that for a very long time, there has been a sort of a difficulty about embedding apprenticeships into the creative industries. And Actually, in the regions, we have found embedding apprentices into companies is, has been a very, very good thing because there is a smaller talent pool in regional areas. And so you have to kind of breed your own. And then you take them in as apprentices and you skill them up and you bring them into the company and they remain there being a sort of absolute spine of what you're able to do and for us it's worked in terms of post-production in terms of IT in terms of development finance across the board I think that if we are brave enough and willing to invest in this generation of young people who have been left with this huge debt that they are going to have to mop up. And we can bring them into the creative industries, which is one of the great success stories of the United Kingdom. Then we are going to look after the future creativity of the industry. So that, to me, is one of the big news stories, is the renewed investment into apprenticeships and how the creative industries can take advantage of it. That's right. And that is the Chancellor Rishi Sunak's plan yep. that has been reported today. By the time the show goes out, the budget will have already happened. But that's the plan to inject £126 million into trainee programmes in the UK to boost that, that apprenticeship uh, support. So uh, that can only be a really good thing. Liz, what's your story of the week? Well, my story of the week is it's something that WFTV have been involved with really for most of the year and I touched on at the start of our chat. The campaign group Excluded UK are delivering a letter to the Chancellor this week and WFTV, along with a number of other industry groups, are signatories to the letter, which is asking for changes to be made to the current government financial support schemes, which currently have left around 3 million freelancers and self-employed workers with no financial help. We're now getting on for a year where some people have had no financial support at all. And yet we think that if the will was there, these problems could easily be solved. We've supplied a seven point plan to the Chancellor, as have other organisations, which we think could easily help plug those gaps. And just to give you two quick examples, for example, at the moment, if you're newly self-employed, you can't claim. If you earn less than 50 percent from your freelance earnings, you can't claim. And it's simply unfair. That's definitely something that we hope is going to get a uh, a good hearing. And now it's that time in the show where my guests get to nominate their hero of the week and who or what they're telling to get in the bin. Liz, who's your hero of the week? Well, my hero of the week uh, is Craig Foster and the team behind the remarkable documentary Octopus Teacher, which I watched at the weekend. If you haven't seen the film, I really recommend it. It's not just a beautifully told story about conserving and saving the remarkable underwater kelp forests. It's also about actually a conservation project that Craig and his team have set up called the Sea Change Project to raise awareness of the South African kelp forests. And it's interesting, actually, because when I read about the film, I thought, oh, I'm not sure it's the sort of film that appeals. But I was watching it, actually, because I'm a BAFTA voter, and I was blown away by the film. So I really recommend it. And that's been Oscar nominated, I believe. Yeah, it's on the BAFTA long list. Don't know if it's going to be on the BAFTA short list yet. Right. OK. And who or what are you telling to get in the bin? It has to be Roy Greenslade. He defended his support of IRA terrorism in both the British Journalism Review and the Sunday Times. And I think he honestly doesn't appreciate that it's possible to support the Irish republicanism as public part, as political parties like the SDLP did without resorting to violence. And I think he's also got a somewhat r- romanticised view of the IRA. He claims that the IRA only killed civilians by accident. Of course, that wouldn't even be a defence. But there are many instances when the IRA actively targeted civilians, such as, for example, those in Catholic Protestant marriages. 
Yeah, absolutely. I was uh, shocked. I think lots of people were shocked when they actually saw that uh, that piece running this week. Very glad to see he's resigned from City. Absolutely. Laura, how about you? Who's your hero of the week? Well, my hero of the week is a slightly naughty one because I've just finished watching Call My Agent and I don't know if anybody else has watched it on Netflix. But it's a sort of playbook for our industry. It's a wonderfully wicked French drama set in a talent agency in Paris. And my favourite character, my hero, is Andrea Marteau, who is this very strong, feisty chief agent who's gay, accidentally gets pregnant, is a phenomenal negotiator, loves her talent, makes terrible mistakes, cocks it up, fantastic drastically, owns her mistakes, gets up, keeps on fighting again, looks after her baby. I mean, she's just wonderful. And I just think she's such a hero. She's just a woman who gets on and does it, makes mistakes, has all the feelings that we go through. But, you know, I think she's a bit of a hero. So that's my hero of the week. And who or what's going in your bin? So what's going in my bin are those people who decided that they didn't like... BBC's Sonia McLaughlin's interview with Owen Farrell after England failed to beat the Welsh and decided that she was a person that they could troll and hurl abuse at online to the extent that she felt absolutely devastated and was brave enough to tell the world that she was sitting there in tears, having been absolutely ripped to sheds online. Now, some people may feel that, you know, if you're in the public eye and, you know, you should take what's coming to you. You know, I think those people who choose to fight and say horrible things, vile, abusive things, should go in the bin. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen that growing, unfortunately, particularly in sports, I think, not only having football players and and other players being attacked and targeted via Twitter and other social media platforms, but we've seen, as you say, commentators and panellists also attack. Maybe that's just a, an unfortunate side effect of us being locked in our houses, but there's absolutely no excuse for that. So absolutely. But, you know, they would probably never do that face to face. Yeah, absolutely. Keyboard warriors, we can all throw them in the bin. Camilla, who's your hero of the week? My hero of the week, and in fact, one of my heroes of not only the decade, but probably of my career has been a great inspiration for me. And I think he's an absolute star beyond, as everyone does, is Russell T. Davis. Um, I think that what he's done with his entire body of work, but specifically, obviously, with the incredible It's a Sin, is to combat homophobia in a way that I can't believe. It's unprecedented. I have seen people who I have always thought were potentially a bit dodgy suddenly crying their eyes out watching It's a Sin and reframing how they perceive what being gay meant then and what being gay means now. And I think he's a he's a bloody hero. He's brilliant. He writes humans in a way that I hope I can show humans in a factual sense, the way he does it in a drama sense. I would dream of being at that level. I think he's an absolute superhero and he should be recognised as such across the whole industry. So that's him. Um, <laughs> I, I know that he's been up, he, he, he deserves to win every award there is for that programme. Yeah, anyway, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And he's been rightly lauded across the industry. And who or what are you chucking in the bin, Camilla? Well, the person I want to chuck in the bin um, is actually been dead for, I think, nearly 30 years. And that's uh, uh, Maxwell, because I've been listening to the um, Today's in Focus, brilliant, kind of, and uh, about the book being launched, uh, the book coming out. Um, and actually, I'm just, I, I, it blows me away. When I first started in telly, I was just post Maxwell and the pension scandal stuff. And I worked with a brilliant journalist called Ian Ramsey, who was a Fleet Street, kind of like granddaddy of Fleet Street. He was 64 years old and a researcher. There's no ageism there. Um, on the programme, I first worked. And I was a researcher too, and I was a baby. And and actually, having heard firsthand what Maxwell did to him and his colleagues, and then just listening back to the whole story, I mean, that was a dreadful period of time. Although I, you know, an intriguing and complicated, nuanced man, but still did the most terribly evil things with, with the pension, the people who lost their pensions that time. I just don't think we should forget. It was awful. Yeah, that's media mogul Robert Maxwell is also going in the bin. Yeah. Camilla... Laura and Liz, thank you so much for coming on Telecast this week. It's been fascinating to speak to you and to listen to you as well, discuss all of these different issues that I wasn't aware of particularly as well. So it's hopefully something that, as we say, we're going to be hopefully levelling up when we come out of lockdown. Thank you so much, Justin. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Lovely to be with you all. 
And that brings us to the end of another week's show. As always, thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues on social media. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter called Telecast Plus. It's packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you might have missed, exclusive insight and opinion, including the secret producer, our intrepid, anonymous exec, reporting from the front line of TV production. It's all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in Lockdown 3 in London. Until next Thursday, as always, stay safe. This week's show is sponsored by Insight TV, who passionately create and share content for the experienced generation. Channel provider, content producer, distributor and format seller, Insight TV delivers real-world stories about the adventures, cultural trends and social causes that resonate with today's millennial and Gen Z audiences. Based upon and inspired by social media trends and influencers, Insight TV operates and distributes a flagship lifestyle channel in vivid 4K UHD HDR quality to 315 million homes in 46 countries via linear cable platforms, digital smart TVs, OTT services, and via watchinsight.tv. It also distributes a mobile-first short-form channel in short, action sports channel in trouble, science and tech channel in wonder, and a nature and wildlife channel in wild, a co-venture with Off The Fence, to fast channels and mobile services around the world. Insight TV partners with global brands and broadcasters, such as Red Bull Media House, G2 Esports, Vice Media, and BT Sports, to create factual series like Epic Exploring, I Am Invincible, and Ultimate Goal. To find out how to do great things together with Insight TV, visit insight.tv, or get in touch with the team at marketing at insight.tv.